And we need to tell these stories, um, and obviously Howard Zinn has done something of this, but we need to tell the story to our children so they understand that this is a nuanced history, and it's an ugly history often. Um, and it's a hard history, and it's not this kind of democracy and freedom, that there are some things that are really implicated, right, in the very uh, document of the Constitution and the way it deals with women and, and people of color, right? Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our community conversation, the power of public monuments and why they matter. Let's hear it for them. And I would also like to thank the talented student performers from Project STEP for the musical prelude to this evening's program. In the year 2020, Americans will celebrate 400 years since the first European settlers arrived on our shores. For such a young country, the United States is filled with monuments and memorials to the nation's greatest triumphs and darkest hours. For context, let me just say that Greece retains such landmarks as the Acropolis Citadel, dating back to the 5th century BC. Now, while many of our monuments are beautiful in their own right, a number of them confront topics of ethics, morals, and historical divisiveness. Last summer, PBS took viewers on a whirlwind tour of the 10 monuments that mark key moments in American history. The list, which appeared in national and international publications, included one of Boston's own, the Robert Gould Shaw and 54th Regiment Memorial, AKA the Shaw 54th, about which you'll hear more as the evening unfolds. Now in conjunction with the $2.8 million restoration of the memorial, our hosts, the partnership to renew the Shaw 54th, comprised of the National Park Service, City of Boston, Friends of the Public Garden, and the Museum of African American History, present tonight's program as part of a series of activities. Stay tuned for details on things to come, including the structural restoration of the memorial, serving as the catalyst for the generation to recall an historic event forged by heroes, as well as the ever unfolding American story of the issues of race and social justice. Please help me in welcoming the representatives from the Partners for Brief Remarks, Chris Cook, Boston's Chief of Environment, Energy and Open Space, Liz Visa, Executive Director of the Friends of the Public Garden, and Marita Rivero, President and CEO of the Museum of African American History. Thank you so much. Very good to see you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tremont Temple. What a joy it is to be here. Isn't this incredible? to be having this conversation and to be reminded that active houses of worship are also monuments and also monuments that need investment and need to be protected. We are very grateful for their hospitality here. We're grateful for their mission, but we're also recon we recognize the history of this amazing building as one of the first integrated churches in Boston and how special it is to have a conversation here about the Massachusetts 54th and what it represents. We think about the monument itself but why the monument was built and what it says about Boston and what it says is about the Commonwealth. What is in our common wealth? It is the aspirations of those who put their lives on hold, who faced enormous social pressures to go fight a war that was fundamentally about we as Americans believe and what we think our country should be. It was an extraordinary time for our country. It was an extraordinary time for Boston and it was memorialized with an extraordinary piece of art. And the only thing that probably exceeds the ideals and the design of this incredible artwork is the ideals of why it was created. So we're grateful, we're grateful to be at a point here today where we have enormous partners like the Friends of the Public Garden. And lest you forget the history of the Friends of the Public Garden, it was a much different Boston Common 50 years ago. 
But because of the Friends of the Public Garden and their investment on a yearly basis, the common has returned, and this year will begin a $28 million restoration of Boston Common. None of that. None of that would have occurred without the advocacy of the Friends of the Public Garden. And then we also think about the Museum of African American History and how it has actually changed the face of history in Boston. The opinion of the history of Boston, because the faces were always there. But for the Museum of African American History, we may not have remembered all of the faces that were part of our shared history. And because they have done that, we now have an extraordinary opportunity to celebrate our diversity. None of that would have happened without that organization and the properties that they protect and the programming they provide. So we are extraordinarily grateful at the city for the Museum of African American History. We're also grateful for the leadership in our city. We're especially grateful for the elected officials who are joining us here tonight. If I could have a round of applause for City Council President Andrea Campbell. We're also joined by City Councilor Ed Flynn. I apologize if there's others in the audience that I miss, but I do also want to make sure that on this subject, on this shared history that we're celebrating tonight and speaking on, there's no one who's been a more stalwart defender of that history than former Representative Byron Rushing, who's also with us tonight. And, and very briefly, before I turn it over to Liz, I just want to talk about our other partner in this project. You know, across the street, you have America's First Park. And what we do in America's First Park sets the tone about the values that we care about. So we need to take care of that space because it sends a strong signal. The National Park Service has made sure to be our partner in this memorial. And currently, the National Park Service which arguably defends our most valuable of assets, our actual public land, the source of so much conflict throughout our history, is currently shut down. We have extraordinary partners at the federal level. When a kid kicks a soccer ball, the kid doesn't care if the governor's in charge, the mayor's in charge, or the president's in charge. The kid just needs to be able to kick the soccer ball, and there's no reason for parks to be shut down in the United States of America. <laughs> Whatever your ideology, you can get behind the fact that we should have access to those living monuments, and we are extraordinarily grateful to the partners we ha have in Boston, and especially to our superintendent, Michael Creasy, for his leadership. I thank you all for attending this evening and the discussion that we're going to have. I'm excited about the direction of the city. The mayor of Boston is extraordinarily excited about the renovation of Boston Common. And Mayor Martin J. Walsh is very, very proud that soon we will have a King Memorial in our city to celebrate our history as well. And with that being said, it gives my great honor to turn it over to the executive director of our partners in our parks, the Friends of the Public Garden, Liz Visa. Thank you, Chris, so much for those kind words. Um, we have, in fact, been partners. It'll be 50 years in 2020 that we've been working together to care for, renew, and advocate for the Boston Common, the Public Garden, and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. These are essentially important public spaces in our realm. The city would not be livable without its parks, and it's so wonderful to be able to partner with a, a partner like Chris and like the Parks Department. It's really an honor to do the work that we do. I want to welcome you all. It's wonderful to see you here tonight. You will be uh, enjoying a stimulating evening. I look forward to it as well. But I first want to have a couple of thanks to people. Uh, first, we have a wonderful honorary committee that has been put together to uh, help us renew and, and talk about, expand our renewal of this, of this monument, to have a conversation about 
race, justice, and freedom. So we pulled together an honorary committee of elected officials, of scholars, of organizational leaders, and including actually some descendants, descendants of uh, Robert Gould Shaw, Colonel Shaw, and descendants of the 54th. And if members of the honorary committee would just stand and be recognized, that would be wonderful. Thank you so much. We're also grateful to all of our sponsors. We could not do the work that we do without the support of, of donors. And uh, one I want to begin with is the Harold Whitworth Pierce Charitable Trust. They gave significant funding to the restoration of the monument, and we're incredibly grateful to them for that, for that support. We also thank the Sala Foundation, who is a sponsor of this event. The media sponsors tonight are Bay State Banner and WCVB Channel 5. It's wonderful, Karen, to have you here with us. Just a wonderful to have you at BRMC. We've also had support from a number of others, including Cynthia and Theodore Berenson, Eastern Bank Charitable Foundation, Mr. and Mrs. John Winthrop, and the Four Seasons Hotel Boston, who has given our panelists rooms for tonight. As you've heard, the Shaw 54th is one of our country's greatest public monuments by our greatest classical sculptor, Augustus St. Gaudens. Marita Rivera will talk about the meaning of the memorial and the men who were memorialized. I want to touch on the restoration and what we're doing to this over 120-year-old monument. We uh, started our first campaign, the Friends, we began in 1970, and in 1981 we began our first campaign to support and restore this monument. There was not a picture of it, but in 1980 it was the victim of vandalism, neglect, and corrosion. It was in terrible shape. So we raised $200,000, which seemed like a lot of money back then, and we restored the monument and set up an endowment for its care, and we've cared for it ever since. Despite that regular care, however, water has worked its way into the core of the monument and down into the foundation under the bronze, which has deteriorated to the point where it is vulnerable to seismic events. And we realized we needed to do something fundamental, literally. So we are going to be, in the spring, taking all the stone and the bronze off from the plaza level up, bringing it off-site to a conservation studio, re-waterproofing the plaza, shoring it up, and rebuilding that foundation under the bronze to be concrete and stronger than the brick foundation it is, and then rebuilding it all again, which is what cost $2.8 million. It will take up to six months of work. Again, the government shutdown is impacting the progress of this project, so we hope that this is resolved soon because this is really important work that needs to move forward. The uh, work is being part of the partnership of that particular part is the city, the federal government, and the, the friends. The National Park Service is bringing $1.4 million to this project. This is really an incredible amount of money that they are dedicating to this work. And the rest of the money is coming from the friends and the city. The Museum of African American History joins us as a programming partner for our year of events. They bring a deep understanding of the African American story in Boston and the city's strong abolitionist roots. Using this work as a platform for dialogue on the issues of race, freedom, and social justice could not come at a more important moment in our turbulent times on the national stage. And with that, I want to pass it to Marita Rivero. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and good evening. Thank you, Liz. Uh, it's been a real pleasure working with our partners, people who are, are deeply engaged in, the, in this work. Uh, I'd like to thank them, our honorary committee, uh, our board chair, Sylvia stevens Edward is out here, our board members, and so many of you I see who have been engaged in these issues and concerned about our history and about our future. The museum operates two sites, you may know this, one on Beacon Hill, and one on Nantucket, and I urge you to visit them. The north slope of Beacon Hill, that whole slope, was the black community. We've created a black heritage trail which begins at the Shaw Memorial so that we can consider these early times and issues and lives in relationship to ours now. It is surprising how much they overlap and help us think about today's issues, which is what we are going to do this evening. Let's go back right now, though, to the mid-1800s, when the Union was losing the Civil War. President Lincoln responded to pressure from white and black abolitionists, including Boston's Lewis Hayden, who lived on the North Slope. His message, 
Hayden said black men were needed to fight if the war was to be won. He and other black leaders were prepared to raise a first black regiment in the North. Frederick Douglass was proposed and accepted the idea that he would devote himself to recruiting the 54th. And he did that from Ohio, all throughout the New England states. People arrived from Canada. Uh, they came from the Caribbean. His two sons, Charles and Lewis, enlisted from New York. The 1863 Emancipation Proclamation was signed and recruitment could commence. Within weeks, nearly 1,000 black men reported into Boston. And this was despite the fact that were they captured, they would be enslaved or killed. Our museum's African American Meeting House up there on Joy Street was a recruitment center. Of course, black men weren't allowed to be officers. Uh, and so a Civil War veteran, someone who'd fought at Antietam, the son of a family of wealthy and uh, deeply concerned abolitionists, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, accepted the commission. A few months later, when the 54th Regiment left Boston, it was with much fanfare and a great deal of public discourse. They par paraded here on the Common. There were speeches. Uh, they marched straight up Beacon Street on the way to the Boston Harbor. They boarded steamships and landed in South Carolina, and shortly after that, entered the war. The regiment proved without doubt their ability, their courage under fire, and their valor. This was additional cause for celebration because it changed the stereotype, the cartoonish image of black men that had long been promoted. They became so well known that they were referred to simply as the 54th. The Shaw Memorial was dedicated and unveiled on Memorial Day in 1897. Harriet Tubman was president, present then as she had been 34 years earlier when the 54th left for South Carolina. These stories come to us through many venues, but having this story part of a major piece of public art prominently displayed as an example for all of us to consider is just immeasurably important. Thank you for coming this evening, and I look forward to the panel as you do. Thank you, Marita, Chris, and Liz. Now, before we proceed, please be aware that Beverly Morgan Welch from the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and Michael Creasy from National Parks of Boston, unfortunately, were not able to participate on stage tonight due to the government shutdown. But Michael's here. Where are you, Michael? Thank, thank you, Michael, for being here. We want to thank them for their support of this event. We also have WGBH to thank for taping the program to post online to the WGBH Forum Network. Now, let's get the conversation started, which we hope will help deepen and expand the dialogue on race, freedom, and justice. Before we begin, however, please make note of two things. First, the index card you received with your printed program is for your written questions. This will allow our panel to respond to as many questions as possible. Please keep your question brief, print very clearly, and include your name if you would like us to announce it when your question is read. Before the panelists complete their conversation, we ask that you pass your cards to either end of your row where a volunteer will collect them. For those of you who are on social media, you may use hashtag Monuments Matter to submit questions. And please note, we encourage and thank you for live tweeting during the program. Although we do want you to turn the ringer off on your cell phone. And second, we hope you will join us for a dessert reception and to keep the conversation going at the end of the program. Our ushers near the door will lead the way to the stairs and the elevators. Please be sure to sign our guest book at the reception so that we may notify you about future Shaw 54th updates and events. So now, without further ado, I am pleased to introduce four luminaries in the fields of activism, 
public art, history, and journalism. In the interest of time, I ask that you hold your applause until all have been introduced. First, DeRay McKesson is a leading voice in the Black Lives Matter movement and author of On the Other Side of Freedom, The Case for Hope, which makes the case for hope in our society and opens a view on the costs, consequences, and rewards of leading a movement. Renee Ader is an associate professor emerita at the University of Maryland and a scholar of 19th and early 20th century art of the United States, whose research focuses on monuments, race, national identity, and public space. F. Sheffield Hale is president and CEO of the Atlanta History Center, which is dedicated to sharing stories of Atlanta's past, and his current affiliations include serving as a trustee of the National Historic Trust for Historic Preservation. Now to lead the conversation and help our panelists delve into the often controversial significance of monuments in our culture and their relationship to issues of race, public memory, national identity, and social justice, our moderator, Derek Z. Jackson, is a multiple award-winning journalist, photographer, author, and former Boston Globe columnist who also authored a paper on the national media's failure to cover the Flint water crisis. Please refer to your program for their full bios and please don't wait until the end of the conversation to draft your question. And now I ask Derek Jackson and our panelists to join us on stage. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. Um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Also, thanks to um, Liz and uh, Marita for the invitation to moderate. As many of you know, um, it was really supposed to be uh, <laughs> Beverly Morgan Welch, um, but that government shut down. <laughs> um, <laughs> so tonight, we hope to uh, explore with our panelists uh, from both historical and contemporary perspectives uh, the role of public monuments in our society and over time and how monuments can serve as moral touchstones including whose stories are told, whose stories are not told, um, and the relationship uh, uh, to public spaces and um, how the Shaw 54th speaks to us today. Um, on memorials and monuments the philosopher of art, Arthur Danto, said, we erect monuments so that we always remember and build memorials so that we shall never forget. Others, like NYU professor and author Marita Sturkin, tease out distinctions between monument and memorial in terms of both form and function. She wrote that uh, memorial monuments have been used to uh, uh, rely on abstract uh, visual cues uh, to convey their message. Um, Renee, um, one of the most powerful writings I've seen about a monument or memorial uh, was your reaction to uh, visiting the uh, uh, Equal Justice Initiative Monument um, to lynching um, in Montgomery, uh -huh. Alabama. You wrote that you were, quote, surprised at the strength of my emotion when I entered the memorial space. I cannot stop the tears from flowing and my heart aching. I am overwhelmed. The hanging rusted steels are gut, steel steels are a gut-wrenching reminder of black bodies hanging from trees. On each, it's a stele, right? Yes, stele. <laughs> yeah. On each stele, I see the names of individuals and the dates of their murders. They represent the 4,000 real human beings lynched systematically and with impunity by white citizens of the United States. I reach out to touch a name, tracing the laser cut forms of the letters in an attempt to make more tangible their presence. I lean into one of the stele seeking bodily connection and I feel a sadness and anguish so powerful that it lashes deep into my psyche. Intellectually, I am surprised at my response. Yet the emotional upheaval I feel is real and powerful. I am witness to what had been 
an unspoken and hidden holocaust of black men and women in the United States and is now made visible. Perhaps starting with you, Renee, but all three of you, uh, what, mon what monuments, it, United States, globally, evoke that kind of power or, or should evoke that kind of power? So it's interesting. I think that the lynching memorial in Montgomery, for me, is a I'm not sure there's another one that's quite as effective as that memorial. Um, I think its form, I think the recovery of history and the stories it's telling are really powerful, right, when you enter that space. So the one memorial that I might say that's, it's very different from that, but is the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. I think there is a consistent kind of way in which American citizens interact with that. Um, there's kind of a sanctity when you enter that, uh, the space of the, basically a temple, a Greco-Roman temple. Um, there are the texts on the wall that force you to kind of engage and read. And I've taken, you know, over 20 years of teaching, taken a lot of undergraduates uh, to that memorial. And there's a way in which they engage that as well. And kind of the, the notions that you can learn history from a monument, or you can learn um, that there is um, this notion of, I guess, I w what I would call even sacredness, the sacredness of space as you enter that. Um, so that's the one memorial that really pops out for me as the Lincoln Memorial. I was, uh, I was just in Haiti, I got back from Haiti yesterday, and I was working with teachers or on teacher prep, but one of the things that we did is that we saw a lot of the memorials to the Haitian Revolution. Mm. And there are three things that sort of come to mind. I think about these public displays as either acts of uh, memory or acts of celebration, and this question of like, what do we choose to remember and what do we choose to celebrate? There's some things that do both, and there's some things that just do one. But in Haiti, it was fascinating to see the citadel, which uh, was built to, to house all the Haitian people. If the French came back, it was like that was what the citadel was supposed to be, and now it, it still exists. The palace uh, that the guy who, uh, who took over the north, he built a palace. Uh, there's also a, a huge monument where the last battle was fought. And then there is, we were in Guanaive, which is the, the town where the actual like, proclamation of independence was signed. And I'll never forget, because it was just two days ago, so it's easy to remember. Uh, <laughs> being with these fifth graders, we were fifth and sixth graders, and we asked them, like, what is your, what's like your favorite subject? And all of a sudden, they were like, all these stories about the revolution. Like, that was, they, they were like, you know, we, I like Toussaint because Toussaint was the one who like led the people, and I like um, Desalines because Desalines was a person who, like, it was sort of fascinating to see them really grapple with the details of history and what it meant. And, mm -hmm. and I asked them, like, why does this matter to you? And they said, because they fought for us, I can fight too. And that was something that, when I think about this, this question of like, uh, what do memorials do? What does, it, what does it mean that we choose public spaces to celebrate and to remember? In Haiti, I saw young people actually understand that really well and be able to recall like, oh no, the Citadel is where we were gonna go if the French came back. And oh, that palace was gonna do this thing. And oh no, I love my town because we signed it here. And I think about that, you know, I'm always interested as an activist in like the ways we do tell stories of resistance and the way we do tell stories of revolution or the ways we don't. And I'll say, like, as a sort of corollary to that, I was in South Africa a month ago, and one of the things that was fascinating about the Apartheid Museum is that Soweto is a pretty small part of the museum. Mm -hmm. The museum's pretty big, and Soweto is like a nice little corner, and there is no revolution without Soweto. So, like, just seeing the different ways that we use public spaces to tell stories about people who rose up against people in power continues to fascinate me. Uh, for me, I've, I've been to the... Uh, um, memorial or the memorial that's in uh, Montgomery and and to walk around there mm -hmm. and to go and visit and to specifically go to look for counties where members of my family lived over the last couple hundred years in both Georgia and Alabama mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was just you know it was gut-wrenching mm -hmm. and you know and I, w I would go and, and I would see and there were two in this county and three in this county and here's the period they were and I think about who was living in my family at that time in that county and what they knew about it and, uh, or didn't know about it. And, uh, and so for me, that was, it was powerful. In, in terms of others, the, uh, I, th I, would, I would have to say the Vietnam Memorial, mm -hmm. be, not as much because it's impact on me, but it's impact on, on Vietnam veterans that I watch 
Um, we do a lot of oral histories at the Atlanta History Center, uh, Veterans Oral Histories, and to hear them talk about it, and to hear them talk about going, and having reunions at that wall, and oh. touching the and touching the names, um, is is to me that sh speaks to that power, and that is a memorial and not a monument. Oh. Um, and then the other one that the other one that probably took my breath away was the 9/11, um, oh. and is looking into those. Um, uh, fountains that don't, you can't see the bottom of. Right. Um, it was just brilliant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think about people I know who are no longer here. Mm. So where, does, where does the Shaw 54th fit into this, this picture of emotion and, and history and memory? Well, from, from my standpoint, there, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing like it in America, really, in, in terms of uh, the time period, the subject matter, the you know the beauty of it, but uh, and, but the the resonance that it has had then and it still has today. Um, it, it it but it's but it's of a if it's of a time and so if to compare to the ones we just talked to, mm -hmm. they're all abstract. Yeah. You know, these are real people, albeit not necessarily people who were in the regiment. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's a totally different kind of monument. But it's but it's something that speaks to us today because it speaks to the agency of the people involved that they were liberating themselves, and that's something you don't see almost anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Well, I wonder if the uh, for me the uh, you know that's an interesting question to think about how it fits as far as kind of an affective affective uh, monument how we might. Um, the reason I keep, you know, I keep coming back to that Memorial Montgomery because of the, the really astounding emotional engagement that you have. It doesn't matter if you know somebody on that wall. It's entering that particular space that is designed to be a sanctuary. It's a really interesting uh, tension that um, plays out there. And so I think the 54th is different from that. It's not um, a monument, I assume, that uh, the Park Service encourages people to touch and, uh, you know, in that sense, no one's going to take a steli home to their, their uh, you know, a soldier home, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it is a memorial that persists both art historically, right, as a, as a particular kind of form. Um, but it persists because I actually think it's good art. And I know that that, you know, that's a real serious value judgment that I am uh, making there <laughs> about good art, um, but I think that it has, uh, had su has such staying power because St. Gaudens did an astonishing thing with that memorial, and that's the combination of this high relief with the full equestrian monument. That's an astounding innovation that he does, um, and you can see the, how artists start to respond to St. Gaudens for the next hundred years. Um, and so for me, the 54th, interesting enough, has a lot of resonance because contemporary artists engage it. And so I have written about a memorial in Washington, D.C. called the African American Civil War Memorial, which is a direct response to St. Gaudens. Mm -hmm. This is an artist who saw the plaster cast at the National Gallery of Art, um, and a contemporary African American artist, Ed Hamilton. And he wanted to actually, I mean, this is the most fascinating thing. He wanted to actually foreground African-American soldiers. So he complete, like in his memorial, there is no white officer. It is black men standing on the ground armed. And so it has a very different kind of power. And so in some ways, ways someone like Ed ha Hamilton was subverting, right, the St. Gaudens uh, Memorial. Um, but I still think that this is a really... I have very complicated feelings about this memorial, but I think it still has this incredible staying power all these years later, that it still has this kind of resonance as it sits there on Boston Common. I think it reminds me, you know, Baldwin has this incredible quote where he says, whiteness is a metaphor for power. And he's reminding us about the ways that whiteness is always rooted in, in notions of domination. When I think about the memorials, mm -hmm. when I think about Shaw, I'm reminded of the relationship between domination and display. Mm -hmm. That like, what, does, what, do, what do people who dominate other people like put on display? And, and we sort of talked about it before that in this country, it was black bodies that were on display hanging from trees as like, as like its own form of a power relationship for so long. And I think that what this, what Shaw does, it like begins this conversation about how do we actually like bring, bring black people from either 
the most damaging on display moments and from invisible spaces and make them visible. Like they'd always been present in the work, but like they weren't visible in the way that we had public conversations, definitely not conversations we wanted to remember for years and years. And like, I think Shaw begins that conversation. Uh, so in that way, I think it's like disruptive or begins sort of like a moment of disruption. And I'm interested in that. I, I do think that when we think about all of the, the Confederate statues and memorials, I like keep coming back to this, the question, of the relationship between domination and display. Like what, what is on display and what isn't? And like who chooses, and like who chooses if it's celebratory or if it's just remembrance, right? Like those sort of things are like deeply rooted in this question of who has power and who doesn't. You said you had complicated feelings. Would you like well, to? Well, I wanna actually, yeah, and I wanna ahead. respond to that as well because there are relationships of dominance clearly uh, in that monument. But you know, from my hotel window, I looked down at the Thomas Ball Emancipation Memorial with Abraham Lincoln with the subjugated figure of an African slave at his feet. And so for me, these are fundamentally different types of monuments because of that. So you have one that shows the abject black body, right? Literally the crouching black man who's unable to liberate himself. And it takes Abraham Lincoln with that gesture, right? Everybody knows the statue that's sitting on Plaza Street with the original, original cast in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I think Someone like St. Gaudens, who had, we should call it straight up, what I would call you know, racist attitudes about African Americans, yet he also labored on this project for 13 years, in which he um, you know, strangely asked African American men on the street to come into his studio, a range of, of uh, from young to old to come into his studio. He did not contact anybody from the 54th as studio models, as portrait models for the monument, and that's super complicated. Mm -hmm. Like, why not do that? The 50, they're around. This would have been actually not an impossible task uh, on his part. Um, yet it does this inc incredible, we no longer have the crouching black body. And that's a huge moment in kind of sculpture history, to move from the ball on the ground to the standing men who were in the Union uniform and walk, walking forward. So I do think there's this kind of push-pull between uh, who's in control and who's not. Um, but I also think that this memorial that say God has kind of evolved over time is what I would say as an artist and, and engaging uh, uh, African Americans uh, for, the, for the memorial itself. Mm -hmm. Sheffield, um, you're a renowned, um, you know, for your uh, knowledge on Southern Confederate um, uh, monuments. Um, but you're here in the North. I am. And uh, surrounded by many buildings <laughs> uh, where the wealth also came from slavery. And so when you, in the North, what do you, how do you compare what the, the debates that's happened around the Confederate monuments and how do you can compare that with say, movements to at like Brown University, the mm -hmm. insurance companies in Connecticut. Yeah. Um, how, how do you put that together in, in terms of memory and... and uh, well, I mean, you know, like we all know, the, the whole history of the country is fraught in every possible direction. And, and these issues are coming up everywhere. And they're, just, they're not just in the South. Ours, you know, we just happen to have over a thousand of these things littered about the landscape. So we've got a few more to talk about. Um, <laughs> and some of them are really large, like Stone Mountain. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> which, by the way, um, if you want to talk about power, was started um, as a campaign promise. They had some failed ones early. Restarted um, as a campaign promise two months after Brown versus Board of Education. Huh. Mm. There are no coincidences in this world. And it was finished in the 60s. So that's what was driving it was massive resistance. It's not a Jim Crow monument like I like to call a lot of them. It's a massive resistance monument. It's clearly not about anything other than power. Mm -hmm. Though it may be about loss, but not loss and grieving, but loss of power and fear of loss of power. So there are all these things that are mixed up. And yeah, exactly when you talk about, you know, it's somebody who's in charge, who's, who's deciding. But you see this through the North. You see this, I got a call from a, um, the colleague at the Chicago History Center. He said, the mayor there um, had called him about a statue. And I said, really? <laughs> <laughs> Which one is that? <laughs> What's your problem? <laughs> and he goes, General Sheridan. 
I say, General Sheridan, you mean that SOB that did X, Y, and Z in the Shenandoah Valley? <laughs> uh, what's the problem with him? He said, well, apparently he's attributed to saying there's no, no good Indian but a dead Indian. Which he probably didn't say, but he did kill a lot of Indians. Um, so there's issues in Chicago. There are issues in Philadelphia. There are issues in, in Pittsburgh over the Stephen Foster statue. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's everywhere you go that's fraught. I love it, though because this is a way for us to talk about our real history. If we mm -hmm. could strip through this mm -hmm. and you can mm -hmm. take these things and turn them into artifacts and let them speak to you. And the, you know, a lot of them I like to say aren't about the objects. So it's not really about Robert E. Lee. It's about the people who erected the statue. Why did they do that in 1930? What was that about? What was going on at the time? What did they say? You know, and, and I assume most of the people in this room probably believe that the Civil War was um, started because of slavery, right? I mean, can I assume that? <laughs> um, hope so. You can't assume that um, in much, much of the rest of the country. Um, and you can't actually assume it on the immigration test either, because there are two, two right answers to that question. What caused the Civil War? Yes. Slavery or economic reasons? So this is something that's deep, and this, but these monuments can give you an opportunity to have this conversation. And that's what I'm excited about. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it makes history relevant, right? Yeah. Well, I'm just, the way you're responding, all of you responding, makes me want to ask, is there a particular city or part of the country that really is um, dealing with this issue of when to, when to take down a Confederate monument or, or dealing with a name change or um, that's really doing it in, in a way that's almost a model. I mean, we have New Orleans and, mm -hmm. and we have Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, um, any, any, mm -hmm. any cities? I mean, I, I, you know, I, we, I, I chaired the Monument Committee in Atlanta, so of course we did the best job. <laughs> um, I, I obviously didn't give the mayor enough money in his reelection campaign, he appointed me co chair of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, but what we did is we copied actually Baltimore which had done a spectacular job of mm -hmm. doing deep dives on each of the monuments describing who, who erected, why they were erected, and what they were about. And that's what we ended up doing, is doing the, really the same thing. Richmond's done a great job, and it, but they hadn't been able to do anything because there's nothing in, they, they prohibited under Virginia law, like a lot of southern states are, from removing them. And then they're sort of frozen. And how do you contextualize this huge statue of Lee on a horse on Monument Avenue. It's hard technically. Yes, it's really hard. And I would actually um, say that a lot of states aren't doing a good job. Okay, so you can change legislation. Okay, this is something that you can, in, in, in Alexandria, there is a Confederate monument that sits in the middle of South Washington Street in downtown Alexandria. This is a monument that can actually be moved. Yet the state legislatures refuse to actually bring it up for a vote. So for me, this is a really big issue when, when you know, we can say, oh, well, it's written into your constitution. Some of these are actually in state constitutions, like the Alexandria statute, that it cannot be removed, which means a constitutional amendment must be made in order for it to be taken down. Um, I do think Baltimore, you know, I remember with Baltimore, I mean, you're from Baltimore, but I do remember thinking, how smart to take it down in the middle of the night. Isn't that what happened at Baltimore? Literally, we woke nope. up and we were like, they were gone. They're gone. <laughs> and it, there was no fuss. There were no snipers on the roofs. There were no, um, no brouhaha. The mayor, I thought, made a really smart decision. Um, and she, they were gone. And then the conversation can move to a different space, I think, once that happens, once they're gone. Yeah, right? yeah. I do think, too, that the statues might be just the tip of the iceberg in the conversation yes. about like what, the, what are memorials to the worst parts of this country's history. I'll never forget being in Montgomery for the first time, which was not three days ago. <laughs> and um, we were walking down the street, and I was like, why is this called Commerce Street? And uh, the person I was with, who was actually from EJI, he mm -hmm. was like, it's called Commerce Street because this is actually where they would walk the slaves down, and the slaves were commerce. And I was like, that is crazy. And then it was like, oh, Commerce Street actually hits, it ends at Market Street. And I'm like, oh, why is this called Market Street? Street? It was like, because it was a slave market. market. <laughs> you're like, well, that is even crazier, right? Like, and you think about the ways that we've actually encoded some of like, the legacy of the worst parts of our history into like, the everyday life of people. Oh, wow. Or you think about in Montgomery is a great example, too, of uh, after the bus boycott, 
the White Citizens Council took over the highway administration and paved in front of the churches that organized the bus boycotts, right? So when you talk to elders in Montgomery, they talk about the highways as memorials to the worst parts of this country, right? They aren't, they aren't worried as much about the statues. They're like, we used, to, we used to play right here and it is now a highway. And like that was done intentionally. And what would it look like to do un undo those things, right? What would it look like to like be honest about the legacy of those things and the impact mm -hmm. of those things at scale? Mm -hmm. Like that to me, I think the statues sort of enter us into a space to really talk about what does it mean to memorialize and to celebrate hate at scale? Mm. Just one thing, Mo many of monuments, memorials start with a top-down process. <laughs> um, people, government leader figures, um, community uh, folks get together, we'll, we'll get something, we'll raise some money and we'll build something. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about grassroots creations of monuments and memorials? I'm thinking um, uh, offhand, um, I'm an outdoors person and I think of ghost spikes. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those, uh, ghost spikes are uh, bikes that are painted white and are put at uh, intersections where bicyclists have been killed. And what I find powerful about them is they're not just a memorial like a cross on a highway or, or a, sh uh, a shoulder where some uh, driver or pedestrian was killed. What I've uh, experienced is that these ghost bikes end up also being political, extremely political movers of getting cities to actually build bike lanes and, and, and promote um, uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety. So I'm just wondering, uh, what, if, what, what would people that you talk to, what memorials do people want to see? And I, I think just to add to that, here uh, the Museum of African American History, their Young's, their Scholars Program of teenagers, middle school and uh, high school students, they went around looking at monuments um, uh, this past summer and they looked at the Ball Memorial mm -hmm. and they noted that they didn't like it, <laughs> that a black person was in a servile position. Mm -hmm. They also looked at the Christmas Attics um, 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 uh, statue and they said that he's too small. Whereas they actually looked at the Shaw and said, that's good. <laughs> it, things, things seem to be de depicted right. So from a grassroots perspective, if, if grassroots people were doing monuments and memorials, what would they be, what would they be building? You know, I, there are countless black and brown people, women, LGBTQ people that we should be celebrating that we've just ignored. So I think that that is like a, I think that is an easier part of the conversation. I'm interested too in like how we, uh, this question of like how we tell stories of resistance and revolution and how we just don't tell them, like what does that mean? So I think about like, we could just do statues of like all the first and that would be interesting enough, you know, <laughs> like that would be cool. I met with the Google Doodle team not too long ago and, um, and they were talking about the Google Doodles, like when you go to google.com and mm -hmm. it's like the photo in the picture. And they were like, we didn't realize why all the doodles at the beginning were white people. Like in the very beginning of Google's history, like it was all white people. And somebody wrote a blog post categor like categorizing every single one and being like, they are all white. And the doodle people were like, what, what, like we're not racist, like we didn't do this on purpose, what happened? And what they realized is that the rules were set up to say that the only way that they recognized you was if you, uh, if, if you were dead and if they knew your birthday. Those, like, you had to meet those two conditions. And what they realized is that there were a lot of like, people who were enslaved, a lot of Native Americans who like, they didn't know their birthday, so they were automatically excluded from being recognized, right? And I'm interested in the way that those things actually factor into the way that we choose to make these decisions. So they undid that, and now you've seen like, the doodles be so incredible and like, recognize a lot of people. But like, if you need an enslaved person's birthday, then you're like, you just X them out of the equation, right? And that's what they did. So this question of like who, I think the who is like, I think a lot of activists, I think a lot of firsts, I think a lot of the simple stories, like the, the people who, like I think about reconstruction. I'd love to see like a set of memorials to reconstruction, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, that's a major untold story in this yeah, country, is, reconstruction. Yeah. I didn't learn about reconstruction, so I was way out of every schooling, like <laughs> high school, college, it was like Twitter and podcasts that taught me about reconstruction. 
<laughs> and I think that you know, monuments are not always from the top down. I actually disagree a little bit with that. I mm -hmm. think, um, I know of a couple monuments where they are completely, there's a, the, uh, the Contraband and Freedmen um, Cemetery Memorial in Alexandria it was started by two women who for 10 years, they just persisted. They had a memorial service every Memorial Day and brought flowers to the site. Uh, and, the, and it's a very controversial cemetery because they built uh, a gas station over it. Um, knowing that it had been on maps, knowing that this was a location where there were black bodies um, from fugitive slaves who came into Alexandria in uh, 1863 after the Emancipation Proclamation was read. Um, and so in that instance, you have these two women, and I think they drove the city and the state crazy. They emailed and called and started a friends group and a newsletter until finally they had a monument. I mean, and this was astounding to me that these two women I just kept at it. Um, and they sued the state because they built a freeway near this cemetery. I mean, they did, they were very activist in their approach. Um, and I think, you know, someone like Erica Das, who's uh, written a book called Memorial Mania. We have m memorials at the grassroots levels that go up all the time. And I think that we should just acknowledge that, whether it's the teddy bear that sits at a site where someone was shot on a corner, or whether it's a memorial uh, to someone uh, who was hit in a traffic accident or on the side of a road with the cross with flowers. So I think that there's a kind of a memorial culture that's actually flowing through us um, and that we do this individually um, in really interesting ways. Um, it takes a lot of money, as we know, to build a monument. Um, but I am impressed by these smaller works. Oftentimes I'm encountering uh, with the project I'm working on about slavery monuments, contemporary monuments to slavery, where it is a, either one person or a group of people who, who kind of activate the conversation and say we need to start talking about the history of slavery in our community. What does it look like? There, and there has to be kind of cross dialogue. It can't just be like kind of African Americans presenting the history of slavery. Right. This needs to be a very deep conversation that includes kind of the whole community and, and how does that look? So, and Alexandria also did something which I was happy to see that you all have also done, but were they, um, for the King Monument Design, were they involved the community? And that's really important for monument design overall. Um, this is interesting, this kind of open community, communi uh, community forum here, but to invite people to come and look at maquettes, right? So they have immediately say, you know, I don't like that. And that they can leave comments in Virginia and Alexandria. They took very seriously the public's comments about the memorial design for the cemetery. Um, and people are really satisfied with that monument. It works really, and in fact, when you ask about one that's effective, that's another really effective memorial because it was community-based, it was historical societies got involved, the state was involved, their archeological programs were involved. It was kind of a whole kind of approach, right, to thinking about monument building. Um, so that to me is really interesting is when it becomes the individual who says, you know what, we need to, I know this history, it's in my community, I want it told, so how do I go about doing that? How, whether it's a memorial or a new kind of story that's been, that they want to write, or it's a blog post, or it's a, a tweet, or it's a website, whatever it might be. Well, I'm in violent agreement. Uh, because of the History Center, what we've done on the Confederate monument issue is to create tools to empower troublemakers all over the country to have the research available, to have how do you contextualize something, how do you do research, what are the best books, articles, we have all the articles from what's happening in all the cities around the country that we update every day. But the whole point is it's a grassroots thing because most of the big monuments were top down. And I think the best way to change them is to have it grassroots, particularly in smaller communities. Mm -hmm. And if you can get a high school class or you can get you know, uh, two ladies or somebody, mm -hmm. you give them the tools to say, well, this is what happened in this monument, and this is what other cities are doing, and we ought to either contextualize it, move it, or remove it, but let's have a conversation about it based on the facts, and this is what they said. You give them the tools, that to me is the most effective way to do it, um, at least in the South, because nobody in, in rural Georgia, for example, wants anybody in Atlanta to tell them what to do. Right, I, I know that, uh, and they don't want the Atlanta History Center. To, but but somebody in their community finds it, finds this tool, and comes it to themselves, and it's like, okay, I have to deal with them. 
One thing about um, the traditional, you know, giant memorials, uh, somebody on a horse with a sword, um, the, the space devoted to them, as all kinds of communities that are get, being, have been empowered over the years, people of color, uh, gay and lesbian folks, um, all kind of, I'm just thinking today, the woman who, the woman who uh, was the, the mother of Title IX, who just passed away. Um, uh, what, what's gonna be the memorial or monument for her? And one thing that I wonder about, is particularly in cities, is space. Um, an inordinate amount of space has been devoted to the, quote, big statue. In your mind, how as uh, America, hopefully, embraces its diversity um, in, 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 in this space of monuments and memorials, how should we think about it in terms of what's the best ways or the pathways to equal, not, not equaling the score exactly, but making sure that it's the representation is really um, represents uh, the, if, if we can't build, if we can't duplicate the number of statues to white men, how do we do that in a way that still feels equitable? Hmm. <laughs> I'm not, hmm. I, I want to think about that for a second. Like, <laughs> That's why I need the thing. You talk. Um, <laughs> I, I actually want to think about that. In Baltimore, you know, one of the things that we have started to do with the school system is that the school system got a billion dollars probably three years ago to renovate or create, like, renovate every single building in the portfolio and create a couple new schools. And what we found when we first started doing that project was that there was a school every five miles. So we had, we only have about 75,000 kids in the school system, but we have enough buildings for 100,000 plus. So it was like, we have schools everywhere. And that's like not uh, unique to Baltimore, but especially the Eastern cities, like the schools are in some of the most prized land that it could be. And one of the interesting things that we're going through now, because we're renovating every single school in the portfolio, like it's 160-ish schools now, is that we're doing it community by community. And when you, bring the architects in to be in community with parents and kids and like actually talk about buildings you find that parents are like you know the architects are like okay we're gonna make this a glass wall because there's gonna be like natural light and parents are just like they're like we've never seen this in our neighbor like this is there's no building like this it's ever been a building that i've had access to right and like we've actually been working with parents and and students to say like what can we do with this space to to do something different that'll resonate in your community and what can, how can we use it to use public art and incorporate that in just all new ways because the space is already prime and it's already everywhere, like you pass it every day anyway. And that's been an interesting way for us to think about how do we use like space that already exists and just repurpose it a little bit or add to it as we go through other big projects, especially in communities where people have never been valued enough to be brought to the table to actually be a part of the design process. I thought a minute. Thank you. <laughs> um, we don't have enough space. And I don't think there can, there is not enough land to, to really recognize like the full diversity of American history. Let's get real about this. Um, they just removed the Sturgis Memorial um, from Central Park. They're putting it in a cemetery. He is the man, the gynecologist, who basically experimented on three uh, women who he purchased, black women, as slaves, and he did horrendous things to these women. But he's the founder of modern gynecology. I mean, he mm. figured out ways to cure these diseases, but operated on one woman 30 times, right, without anesthesia. So these are, like, how do we tell that story? Like, how do we tell the story of those women uh, who, are, um, who are completely neglected, right, in the memorial landscape? Um, they are not heroes in the way, but they are. They actually are, have found what we know to be modern gynecology. Um, I also, this idea that we have to have a monument to, like, who's going to decide? Who are the significant women? Who are the significant, right, Japanese American, African Americans, Native Americans, Sikh Americans, right? It can go on and on and on, like how we think about this, this memorial landscape. I actually, having worked many years on monuments, think that we need to actually start to think much harder about rewriting curriculum, okay, at the elementary and high school level, like fundamentally. 
Okay, so that if we do not teach our, and I say this as someone who raised a child uh, who's now a 30-year-old person, but if we, I remember, for example, when she was in junior high, there was, there was a page on slavery. How can you have a page on slavery in a junior high school textbook in the District of Columbia in 1989 or 1990 or whatever year it was, right? That doesn't make any sense. And we need to tell these stories, um, and obviously Howard Zinn has done something of this, but we need to tell this story to our children so they understand that this is a nuanced history, and it's an ugly history often. Um, and it's a hard history, and it's not this kind of democracy and freedom, that there are some things that are really implicated, right, in the very uh, document of the Constitution and the way it deals with women and, and people of color, right, that, that we are lesser citizens originally. So I do think curriculum development for me is where it has to happen. And, um, and perhaps Texas can't write textbooks anymore. <laughs> and I know, I say that kind of facetiously, but when, uh, I think it was 2013, 2014, in Texas textbooks, they said that enslaved persons were migrants. Who can write that in the 21st century? I, there are, they, we were not migrants. We came here on ships as bodies and holds of, and, and terror. That is very different um, than this kind of notion of being migrant labor. So I do think this whole way that we talk about uh, American history, about who is part of it, um, needs to be revised. And it cannot continue to be the story of, of just greatness. Well, I, I think it just goes back to you got to be very careful who you put up on a pedestal. <laughs> All right, and, 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 and that's something we're, we're seeing in the South, and you need to be very careful about who you're putting up next. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, and you gotta think about it, we all have blind spots, we all live in the soup, right? How is somebody gonna be perceived in 10 or 15 years? Um, so you gotta take that into account, but also there are plenty of opportunities, I think, for counter monuments, additional monuments, editing of, of existing monuments, maybe replacement, We've, we, Lord knows we've sprawled all over the place, and so there are people living in, in places that could use you know, some kind of focus, mm -hmm. some kind of monumental um, drawing together. But, you know, it, it's, I think it's, it's a community issue, and I think it's, it, it needs to be, there needs to be additions, but I think you're right. It doesn't necessarily have to be promiscuous, right? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it needs to be well thought out and impactful. Um, it, it, you know, there's a great opportunity in Atlanta and our, our central, our Boston Common, our, our um, Piedmont Park, where there's a statue that was, um, our committee said should be removed um, in a very prominent location. And uh, it's right steps away from where Booker T. Washington gave the uh, Atlanta Compromise speech. Now how cool would it be to have a statue of him and Du Bois in conversation? You know, or something else there, move that other statue to the side, and put it in a space of prominence, or something else, or an art piece of art. But there are things that you can do. You just have to be creative and willing to do it. Mm -hmm. Duray, you've written, um, the further we seem to move from a given event or way of life, uh, the easier it is for us to believe that it is, I'm sorry, uh, that, that the, distance, uh, the distance from historically damaging events is itself progress. That is, you call it the false distance of history. What would be, how would you bridge the false distance of history with what you think should be the true distance of history? I mean, you know, you, you hear people talk about truth and reconciliation, and the key part of that is that the truth has to come before the reconciliation, right? Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of people that want to do a whole lot of reconciliation with a little bit of truth, right? And it's like, we got we to gotta have a lot of truth. So, you know, when I wrote, when I, I'm fascinated with the way we talk about what progress looks like. Like the First Step Act, for instance, like which passed, it's like the only maybe not awful thing that has come out of this administration right now, um, will impact less than 2% of people in prison. Like people have talked about it as this like sweeping reform. It's like 2% is not a lot. We could have done more, and it actually might open these gateways to really bad things, right? But in a landscape where everything's so bad, it like looks like progress. So the way that we talk about progress is so interesting. Um, I spend more of my time around criminal justice stuff, and it's like, you know, we arrest more people for weed than all violent crimes combined, 
which is wild. A third of all the people killed in this country by strangers is actually killed by a police officer, which is also sort of crazy, you know? That like, when you look at the, when you look at the outcomes, it's still really hard, but people feel better anecdotally, and like that just can't be what that can't be what we go off of. Even with the police, I spend most of my time around the police. And it's like you've seen videos, you've like seen the stories, da da da. The outcomes literally have not changed. The police killed more people in 2018 than they did in 2017, right? But but we think it's progress because the story is being told differently, right? Like people are like are like, oh, I'm more aware, da 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 da. And like, mm -hmm. until we start to have a more nuanced understanding of like what the outcomes actually mean, I, I worry that we'll be stuck in these cycles. So I think about what changes, it has to be things like the curriculum, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. It has to be a recognition that like, structures have to be the fight, the, the level or the lever that we fight at. That like programs are really amazing, but most programs exist because the structure failed in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why you need to feed homeless people under the bridge is because they're homeless in the first place. The reason why you need a million after school programs to teach kids how to read is that they didn't get how to read during the school, right? Like programs are often stopgap measures, but they make people feel good in the moment. You're like, I did that thing. And it's like, we actually have to fight at the structural, at the structural space. When I think about this false distance, it's like, Progress becomes, we sort of like love this idea of progress because people get moved away from the outcomes. I remember meeting with President Obama, like he would be like, DeRay, but it's better. And I'm like, it's not better for any of those families that lost their kids, right? Like it's not actually better for them. Mm -hmm. And like, how do we start to say that like we've made some moves, but the outcomes until they change. And when people tell me, oh, it might be like, you know, I might not live to see the freedom. It's like if they could undo the tax code and not even read the bill, write it on scrap paper, then don't tell me we can't do this in a generation. You know what I mean? That like, they literally did that. He's holding the whole government hostage over a fence that doesn't make any sense. And like, you're telling me I gotta wait 400 years. That's not okay. <laughs> <laughs> Similarly, uh, you know, uh, for, for you two, is mm -hmm. how do you, what's truth to you in a, in a monument? I am not sh sure that monuments are necessarily about truth telling. Mm -hmm. I think that monuments are about encapsulating uh, a particular kind of heroic historical moment. Mm -hmm. It can be about the celebration of our heroes. But, um, yeah, I'm not sure that they can actually do, do that. How much, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that they can reveal truth because, they can, because if yeah. you, it's not the intended truth necessarily. Mm. It's like with Confederate monuments, let's go and find out what they really are. And then that can let you talk about the system at the time and then bring you to the, bring you to the present. Let's talk about Jim Crow. Right. They're reflected in Jim Crow monuments. What are the re legacies of residual of Jim Crow that we were just, you were just talking about, right? It's still there. But truth, I mean, let's take the Robert, the, the, the memorial that we're here to talk about, the 54th. It's an interesting monument because once again, I mean, it's, truthful, right, in the sense that we have, we see marching soldiers, we see the pine cones, which must indicate that it's in South Carolina, with the scrub pines, we see um, Shaw in parade dress with his sword down, marching on that horse, we see, but then there's this allegory, which everyone wants to kind of forget, there is this allegorical figure up there who is holding poppies in an olive uh, branch, and so that, right away, this kind of collision between kind of historical fact and allegory is often collides in monuments. I mean, it's a tradition that goes, I mean, that's very old, right? That notion of, of using allegory in place of what we might say um, uh, truthful history. But oftentimes we're aggrandizing, right? I mean, it's, in some ways monuments are really about propaganda as well, right? Like over time, at least I think they are. That they, whether it's the Confederate monument, whether it's the Shaw Memorial, or whether it's even the cemetery memorial. Um, that they are very much trying to articulate a particular kind of message from a particular viewpoint. So, I mean, we haven't really talked about propaganda, but I think that's also part of it with many monuments. Mm. Yeah. But to me, that's the truth. That's the history. Mm. You see, you, you look at, you, I look at it from the historical standpoint. Yeah. I'm saying, what happened? What did they say? Why did they do it? Mm -hmm. Not what does it mean, right? 
because I, I, can't, I don't know what hell it means. <laughs> but, but, I, but I can find out why they did it, you mm -hmm. know, and what it maybe meant to them. But what it means to us may be something totally different, and it acquires meaning over time. That's right. The wall, and the, we all know this. I mean, there's no monument that gets built where the meaning remains static. Never. Never. Um, monuments are encountered and re-encountered and reshaped and manipulated by all sorts of people, right? And I think the Lincoln Memorial is a really excellent example. Think about how Marian Anderson sang on the stages of that memorial that completely kind of shifted racial politics in 1939 when she gave that very famous concert. Or Martin Luther King appropriating that memorial very particularly. He didn't pick the Washington Monument to stand underneath the monolith, right? No, he picked that memorial as kind of a stage setting and a backdrop. And then Barack Obama does the same thing, making these kind of connections. So um, I think that memorials are both used and shift and are used for very particular reasons during their time period. I think Confederate memorials are oftentimes were create, created by committee of women who had a very particular kind of agenda to remain persistent in the landscape. And they were savvy, right, in that sense as well, in the way that, uh, so I think it depends on kind of the way in which monuments are conceived, the way in which um, these committees are formulated to create monuments um, as well. But this idea, I, I guess I really don't think there's a truth. There's a historical baseline the monuments might be going after. And then from there, you have, it's by committee. You've got artists, you've got, the mayor may be sitting on your committee and you've got the local religious person on your committee and they all have different ideas about what they want that thing to be and their kind of version of what they think history might be. So I'm not sure about this notion of truth. It's just a question. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm not getting all kind of wild over here. Sorry about that. <laughs> I think that I think the two might be something different when the memorials are, con are constructed by people who resisted or fought back like that. Yeah. I will say, like, being in, in Haiti and, like, I don't know how much you know about the Haitian Revolution, but they built the Citadel right after the French got pushed out sort of the first time, which happened to be the last time. But they literally built, like, an entire space where, like, they could fit all the Haitians in if the French came back. Like, that was what it was designed to do. And it still exists. So you see people, we're, like, on people's roofs, and they're like, that is freedom. That is a citadel. That is our reminder, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something really different and subversive about that, like, especially in the landscape, mm -hmm. that is very different than, like, the statues of, like, horses and <laughs> white men with swords. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I do, I'm interested in, like, what would it look like if we did more... And the Museum of Montgomery is one of the first sort of like yes, it is. things constructed literally in resistance, like the goal was to be in resistance. But if we construct those narratives, I do think propaganda is sort of one way to think about it, but like being mindful that everything is a lesson in power, like every, every story is a lesson in power, every piece of art is a lesson in power. And like, what are, what's the story about power that we're trying to tell in these things? And, I, and I, in Haiti, it reminded me of like the story of power that like, the oppressed people can overcome, like that is a different story than we see in the, the Confederate. The Confederate statues are like sort of playing with the white supremacist imagination, right? That is what the, that's the story there. But like, what would it look like to tell a different story at scale? I think is a question about like sort of true and not true, right? Mm -hmm. That like we overcame this or we, we rose up. Like that is like, that feels different to me. Mm -hmm. I actually agree with you on that. Um, and I think that those memorials, partly because you're in, you're in a very different space than the United States, right? And, and the ability for that resistance to happen. Um, and it is, I, I will be really interested to see how the EGI Memorial might become a model of resistance, of telling a story that is so painful that most Americans actually don't even know it, of the lynched body uh, that is pretty much the foundation, right? Uh, of a way of a mechanism of controlling black bodies, black male bodies, but also black female bodies. Um, and does that tell in these painful stories? I mean, I think that's why this gets back to your very, very first question, is why it's so effective. It's telling these stories that are painful, that we in some ways would rather sublimate or not deal with. And Brian Stevenson and the EGI said, no, we have to have this conversation. But he also did something really interesting, which we were talking about, is the soul whale as memorial. And that's a really different issue. Like, how can a memorial be soil in a jar, right? But it is. 
How does it mark that in Georgia, in Macon, Georgia, this lynching happened on that soil? Now that's truth. That's the ground. That's that place where that body hung. And so they have part of the museum where they have these jars full of the soil from all of these locations uh, across the South um, there. So that's actually a very, also really interesting idea of kind of grassroots memorial. That's not a big $5 million project. It's someone in a community saying, I'm gonna submit my soil to the EGI, put it in a jar, label it, and then it'll go into a museum as a way of acknowledging um, the kind of the pain in the landscape of the South. Yeah, we have a veterans park at the History Center, and I guess since the governor started dialing, say that we had veterans bring a soil from all over the world, from where they'd fought in battles in Vietnam and wherever the Americans, to do a soil ceremony on the park, and then to bury it. Um, and uh, I, I did take some from that was from near where the atomic bomb took off to make sure it had it radiated, make sure it was good. Um, <laughs> I didn't want the black helicopters coming down after me, <laughs> um, but but that's what, that was something that we did. Mm -hmm. That way, it was very moving. Mm -hmm. How um, would with the fifty fourth? Uh, you mentioned um, both you and DeRay mentioned curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, how would folks here best activate the fifty fourth? You know, once it's all you know back together and everything. Um, is it, is it schools, is it, is it um, some kind of program, or what, what, what's the best kind of curriculum or education program you've seen around monuments uh, occurring? I'll just say in terms of um, our museum, the coolest artifact that we have, one of the coolest is the, a drum from the 55th Mass. We have one of the largest Civil War collections in the, in the country. And that is something that we, it's a place that has a place of honor and it's gonna be even more emphasized. The problem, the issue, and people love that. And the USCT equipment, they wanna see it and touch it or you know, get close to touching it. Um, that is so powerful to a lot of people because that's, they're seeing themselves represented. Hmm. When they go through and see all of the rest of the Civil War material okay. we have, they focus on that and those other items that we have that we can actually identify to you know, USCT. So there's a resonance to it, and I think museums are one way that that, that can happen. Now, I don't know how the, to be honest, I have no idea how the curriculum works in Boston public schools, but to me this seems like a really easy access point. You've got this a remarkable monument uh, that is on Boston Common, and to actually have either, um, you know, Yale offers these really interesting curriculum uh, programs around uh, objects that deal with race and history that you can that are free online. But I can imagine that you could either have where you're having every single Boston child has to go to that memorial on a field trip, every single one, and answer a series of questions, a worksheet. Um, you could have a really interesting, lively discussion in classrooms where they did dedicate, you know, what is Boston's role in the Civil War? If they're doing Civil War, let's say sixth grade, they're doing it as a history. You could do all sorts of really interesting interconnected things that are not just about the 54th, but what's Frederick Douglass's role in this? What is, you know, I'm sure you must do all this, I'm assuming. Yes, I don't know. But I do think that there's a way to, to incorporate this uh, in, in fairly straightforward ways. Um, I think public programmings are always great to have people, even in the process of the renovation, where people can kind of come and learn about the monument, even though it's like, why are you having the renovation? Why even spend two point eight million dollars on a renovation? Well, you need to because it will sink uh, if you don't. But there's all sorts of things that need to be taken care of. Um, I really believe in that kind of personal engagement with the object. So I'm a huge proponent of people getting out and engaging with the object where it's sited. Right? So I think there's also all sorts of really interesting things. You've got some great monuments on Boston Common that just by itself form a kind of a curriculum. You could talk, you could start with the Crispus Attucks Memorial, right? And then you could do the, is it the, is it Millmore? The really tall column? Um, you could do something around that. You could talk about um, the 54th in the context of that public space. And what does it mean that they are located there and why in, eight, in the 1880s was this this huge push to monumentalize Boston Common like that might be one interesting way to think about it yeah 
I'm always like a little bit cautious when we talk about public education. I used to teach sixth grade math, um, and I was a chief human capital in the school system in Baltimore. So I spent a lot of time around teachers, especially new teachers. And you know, it's interesting because since the protests, teachers are like, "What can I do to like teach justice?" And it's like. Your kids reading and writing and doing the content well is justice, right? Like start there. That's, that's right. <laughs> they like trying to do all this stuff. Can't nobody read, but they're like doing all this extra stuff. So that's like my word of caution to anybody who's a teacher. Like make sure that you can do that. I went to a classroom not too long ago, and like they could do all this interesting stuff that wasn't reading. You know, like they like could talk about sort of the protest, sort of, but like couldn't read. And it's like that's not that is not a win, right? Um, <laughs> I do, I am interested in like how we weave some of these stories into all the content areas. So I can't tell you the number of word problems. Sixth grade, for those of you who haven't been in sixth grade in a while, sixth grade is uh, the last time that kids learn the operations in math. So like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and it's the beginning of uh, algebra. And like I had so many word problems on golf. I don't know anything about golf. They're like something, something par. I'm like, I don't know, skip it, right? Like this is, just, we can't even do this problem today because I don't know what that means. But like you think about all the problems that could actually weave in like these stories, because like we got to do the word problems anyway. And like we could actually use all the content to teach these things. So it's not just the social studies teacher has the burden of teaching every single thing to kids. So I'm interested in what that looks like. And then how we actually just make sure teachers have resource, like, like stories in that, that are age appropriate and grade appropriate like sometimes it doesn't have to be creating like a soup to nuts like everything it literally can be like making sure the stories exist so that teachers can like turn kia for their kids mm -hmm. like that is actually like not only good enough but like perfect in so many classrooms and i've seen people who's heart in the right place try and develop these like really extensive and elaborate and it's like eh, the best teacher doesn't have time for all of that, right? Like that's you gotta pick and choose like the things that actually can be turnkey in classrooms. Mm. The last question before um, we open up for questions and, uh, and answers. What event or persons or people um, who have not been in your view memorialized or uh, properly um, ought to be or should be? Or are there any cities that you think um, for particular events um, that have gone really unrecognized that should be recognized if you're gonna tell the full, full history of that city? I write about in the book, um, there's a professor who started the Montgomery Bus Boycotts. There's a professor who literally printed off 50,000 pamphlets, leaflets in the middle of the night went to the middle school and the high school, passed them out. That is why people stopped riding the buses in Montgomery. Like she did it, she planned it, she like got other people to be involved and then King and crew came down and helped like provide some structure for it. But like we don't even, she, the memory of her is lost and like it was literally a person who was like, I think this is the right time and the right moment to do this. And I would love for us to include her back in the way we talk about like the Montgomery bus boycotts and civil rights in general. I think women have not been memorialized. There are very few statues to women. There are very few statues that acknowledge the contribu significant contributions of women, whether it be history or science um, or a, a whole range of things. So I think there's a way in which we have to actually really have also not only a conversation about race, but also about gender and how does that look in the landscape um, because it's there are very few memorials to women. Um, and I'm actually glad you guys have not put another statue of Harriet Tubman because Harriet Tubman is not the only black woman who was important. And I don't even say, I'm not actually saying that to be facetious, but I'm writing something right now where there are a dozen memorials to Harriet Tubman. There's space for other women to be acknowledged. And I think Harriet Tubman becomes this kind of linchpin because we know her. She's mythic, she's iconic, she represents resistance in some really, right, real ways. So she becomes the thing that we want to anchor ourselves into. But I think that there are other women, both, and I mean across, across races. I'm not just talking about African-American women, but mm -hmm. to think more broadly about that. Any, any two or three that come to mind? Well, I've actually been really surprised that with the Harriet Tubman memorials, why aren't there memorials to Sojourner Truth? Like this has always puzzled me. Um, because they're kind of existing at the same time, they're both public speaking at the same time, yet we have fewer three-dimensional objects, not 
a mural painting, but three-dimensional objects to someone like Sojourner Truth. But there's a whole group of, you know, I'm a huge Ida B. Wells fan, I'm an Anna J. Cooper fan, like I would like to see all of those women memorialized from the early part of the 20th century who were doing radical work around lynching and talking um, about oppression, talking about uh, sexuality in ways that, you know, Ida B. Wells calling out what the real cause, real cause of lynching uh, related to sexuality um, as a myth kind of the oversexed black male and her resistance to that, she deserves a monument. I know there's conversations now in memorializing Ida B. Wells in Chicago, um, but I think that there's a whole group of these women in the late 19th century, early 20th century, for sure, who need to be recognized, yeah. And I would just say the, the people and the era we've already brought up is Reconstruction. In, in African American history, really post-Civil War, pre-Civil Rights, modern Civil Rights Movement, mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of people in there that haven't been recognized. Yeah. Um, there are a few that have, but there are a whole lot more. And that's the untold story. That's the missed opportunity in our American history. And that needs to be told. And right now we're going through the 150th anniversary of that period. It just keeps rolling on and there's opportunities there. Yeah. Well, let's give uh, DeRay, Renee, and Sheffield a hand. <laughs> And I believe, uh, Karen, you're coming. Karen is coming with the questions. There you go. Thank you very much for a very uh, cool, robust discussion. Uh, as we transition into questions from the audience to which our panelists will respond, uh, so you don't have to leave, I invite someone who's quite fluent in both Civil War and Monument history. She's an award-winning artist whose work is in the Smithsonian. And she's Director of Education and, and Interpretation for the Museum of African American History. I'm going to ask Lamurchi Frazier to kick things off. I would like to uh, really congratulate the panel for bringing us such remarkable, brilliant uh, understandings of monuments. And as we consider what they have told us tonight and shared with us, I would like to say that um, we want to think about, as they were talking, I was just thinking about that all spaces, all spaces, <laughs> all spaces are ancient on the earth. And with that, that they are sacred and they have been divided as territories. Those who own them give some voice to what can be on, what can be erected. And so in considering the brilliant remarks about constructing narrative, I wanted to ask the panelists a question about achieving spatial justice. And if we can think about, with respect to monuments standing to materialize our memorial practices that expand and shape the American landscape and other landscapes, as you share with us, DeRay, uh, what's happened in Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, as we consider that as global citizens, we can think about a local application in Boston we can think about a national application, and we can think about what American principles and uh, democracy as practices are represented in these monuments and whether we have achieved any success with that. As you were talking, um, several questions came to my mind. Um, and one of them is how do we achieve balance with respect to what is mythical, what is presented as truth, and then what is interpretation of these standing monuments and memorials, and how do we get the larger voice of community uh, involved. Here in Boston, we have two memorial projects currently uh, that are operating in community and have been, had some jury process and have been worked on by artists. And they are the Frederick Douglass Memorial and the 
uh, Martin Luther King Memorial Projects. And engaging community has been a part of this. Are we looking at a new reimagined public space? Are we looking at reinterpretation for the creation of coming monuments? And who will be the custodians? Thank you, Lamurchi. Well, I'm just trying to contextualize the ones that exist. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms, of what, in terms of what I'm trying to do is to, to tell the truth about what's already there, you know, and, and to have that dialogue. Um, that's a lot. Um, and I'm not sure there'll ever be parity, um, but we can work toward that. And, uh, and but it, it's, it, it's, it's really, it's just an interesting concept, but I think that there definitely needs to be more and there need to be counter monuments and they need to be seated in and they need to be edited and put in the right places. But it's, the question is, is there ever parity between truth and non-truth? I don't know. Fact and fiction. Most of the Civil War um, monuments are fiction. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm going to try to address several of these points. We'll see if I get them. But I wanted to actually just, first of all, just uh, talk a little bit about social justice in space. Um, because for me, that memorial, the, the Contraband and Freedmen uh, Cemetery Memorial in Alexandria is in fact about social justice. It's about the desecration of black bodies that occurred um, and the deliberate desecration because when you dig a gas station, you have to put tanks in. So they encountered bodies and continued their excavation with complete disdain for those black bodies buried there. So for me, these, the two women, which they were interracial neighbors. They're a black and white woman who came together. So in a sense, they wanted that social justice to happen in that space. They wanted the retrieval of the bodies. They wanted them marked. They wanted an acknowledgement by the city that the city had been in collusion with the gas station, which in fact they were, and had permitted them to do this. So in that sense, that's a very effective space, like of what the city of Alexandria has actually accomplished there um, as far as social justice. So for me, that is a reimagined space, a space that I drove by for 20 years that was a grassed over, there was the gas station first, which I'd actually stopped in and gotten gas in, not knowing that there was a cemetery underneath it uh, to the uh, point where it was fenced in for about a decade um, and then now as a memorial. So in that sense, it's really trying to reinterpret the role of fugitive slaves um, in Alexandria and what that looked like. But it does something really even more importantly there. It names every single person buried in that cemetery because there had been a document in the 1860s that had done so. So for whatever, fifth generations of Alexandrians whose family members are buried there, this was a remarkable thing to happen, right? Justice had been served, really, because all of a sudden they realized they have this history that they're directly connected to, that they're not disembodied, that their family didn't show up one day and just was there, right? That they're connected to a deep American uh, history in Alexandria. So, and I know I'm talking a long time, but I, you asked a lot of stuff. So that was, uh, that was one of it. And who are the custodians? Um, that's a really interesting uh, question. What I've been really fascinated with is the transference of some of these properties to the National Park Service. Um, we see that in Washington, D.C., where the African American Civil War Memorial was originally um, one man that just persisted again and then got a committee. And, um, but the Park Service is actually now kind of is, has ownership of that memorial, but it began as a private endeavor, a private slash city endeavor. Um, and I think that balance between mythical and kind of history, like that we keep coming back to this notion of, of truth in history or what we can see, I think what we're trying to get is, part of the problem too is like, how do we excavate the archive to find these stories? This isn't just like a story you heard, but how do we use the archive that has huge gaps in it when it comes to black lives, when it comes to women's lives, um, to tell these stories as well, so. Okay. Does anyone else want to respond to Lamurgy or should we go to our audience questions? We can go to the audience. Okay. Um, how does the digital landscape influence the power of monuments today? Well, I have a digital project. Was that directed towards me? Any, anyone? Of you okay, so I, my, actually, my, my ongoing project is called Contemporary Monuments to the Slave Past. 
It is an enormous digital project, way too ambitious. I am creating a database in which I am trying to catalog every single monument that relates to slavery in the United States. But really, my major goal is through uh, interpretation of those. But I've been running into a little bit of a roadblock because, as we know, the same issues, racism, sexism, all of these things that we encounter uh, in everyday society exist in the internet. It's not as if the digital world just paves that over and it's all smooth and those stories are not uh, are okay. Um, and so one of the issues that I have been very deeply concerned of being in the digital about how we present three-dimensional objects about, uh, really about slavery and about the slave past, um, is how to deal with things like the neo-confederate response to my project. Um, but I also think, for me, the digital realm, one of the reasons I chose the digital is it's a way of actually presenting this material in a form that's very, that most Americans are familiar with, that they know how to navigate, even if it's just a tiny bit. Um, yeah, so. I think about, uh, and to the other question, you know, really mindful about the way we use the word justice. So we think about the difference between accountability and justice, that accountability mm -hmm. is what happens after the trauma. Justice yeah. is the fact that there shouldn't be trauma in the first place. Mm -hmm. So you think about what art can do, like the best sort of justice that can happen from art is like setting people up so that they can make sure that like bad things don't happen in the future. When I think about the digital space, it's like you think about things like uh, Facebook and Instagram. When you die, your Facebook still exists. <laughs> Uh, when you die, your Instagram account, I was just on somebody's Instagram account who passed away, and like every year on his birthday, people some, like leave messages, right? Mm -hmm. And that, So that's like one way that I think that sort of things become monuments and symbols in ways that people sort of, I don't think, anticipated at the beginning. But it also, I think, democratized the landscape of who gets to decide what's important. You've all seen like the viral story about the person that got killed, or the viral cause about the person in jail, or the, and like, they actually hold up a lot of space and can actually mobilize people to do something, and that is just different. Like, what does it mean? I think that when we think about statues, we always think about permanence. Like, it's like a, if the memorial is here in 100 years, that's a sign of success, whatever that looks like. The digital space says that if people look at it and it calls them to do something, that's a sign of success. And I think that's like just a different way to think about memorials. Very good. Somewhat related question, 3D monuments are expensive and therefore will tend to be representative of power or those that can afford to pay for them. Um, I've not heard you say much about 2D art, murals, graffiti, etc., which is more accessible to the grassroots. Could you say more about the place of this kind of art to fill the gap? Sure. I think that um, particularly mural art, I mean, it's is one way. I mean, we have a long history of mural painting in this country that, start, that begins kind of in the late 19th century. And it's been used um, both as for kind of uh, government, as a form of government art, certainly through the 1930s, but also as radical protest art. Um, and I think that mural art is really essential to this. And, and I think that what we think is a monument has to shift a little bit. I mean, I, you're reminding me a little bit of this idea of, let's say, the Instagram account as a memorial that it, it persists over time, right? People are still engaging it. They have a certain kind of response to it. And relationship for, to it. And relationship to it. Um, and so that persistence is important. Um, so I, it's this idea of, I'm sorry, can you read? Yes. Me um, let's see, <clears throat> graffiti, murals, graffiti, etc. Yeah, so I think all of those things are legitimate art forms. And I think that people are engaging those as, as monuments. And I think schools are an interesting place where actually murals get create a, a lot, right? As a way of both connecting uh, young people to art making, but also of telling new kinds of stories through mural uh, programs as well. So I see those as functioning. There are a lot of murals actually to Harriet Tubman on school walls, uh, only because I've looked at a lot of them. So that that is another form of memorialization and brings her actual story in some ways in a much more accessible narrative format, right, to young children and, as well. Actually, Philadelphia is a great example. That's of that. right. Philadelphia has all throughout the city, particularly in black neighborhoods, there's just fantastic mm -hmm. um, art that depicts heroes and sheroes. Memorial and monument have been used fairly interchangeably in this discussion. Do you perceive them to actually be the same or different? Different. <laughs> sure. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, I, are you going to go with that? I yeah. Mean, yeah. 
based on a lot of what you sent me. Yeah, um, so I sent them all an article about the difference between the two. No, but, it's, <laughs> it, but it's, what it's done is given me a great construct to be able to articulate the difference between certain kinds of Confederate monuments. Yeah. The early ones that are about death and mourning and are in cemeteries, those are memorials. The ones that are later are monuments and generally in front of a courthouse or in front and or city down streets. Uh, city streets or mm -hmm. in a public place and of course there are all sorts of exceptions and combinations of the two mm -hmm. some things that are called uh, monuments or memorials and something or have monumental scale or memorials some things that are called memorials are clearly monuments you know what is lincoln memorial i don't know it's a monument. Well, I think it is a monument. So I think that there is a difference between the two for me. One is a memorial really is about the acknowledgement of the dead. And that is quite different from the remembrance of a historic event that you see in a monument. So I, and, and there's kind of a uh, permanence as part of monuments, authority is part of it, pedagogy is. I mean, monuments really are about, in some ways, um, how I think about it is kind of anchoring the past and the present. Right? That is what they do. Um, whereas a memorial, oftentimes also their form sometimes takes a pretty uh, a straightforward didactic form. So they do things like list all the names on a memorial because that's part of it. Someone wants to go and be able to find their loved one's name inscribed on, on that object. So I see them personally as two very different things. Um, but they do, obviously they cross over. Right, so the, the Confederate monuments that were built, in, let's say, in the 20s and 30s, are monuments, and they are meant to intimidate very specifically African American communities. We know this. Um, we can look at the historic document. There is no actually complicated conversation to have about this. About oh, the oh no, it's complicated. Well, <laughs> well you want to, it's, in my world, is very complicated. Yes, of course. What I mean about the, the kind of the function of what their purpose was uh, is fairly clear. Um, but I do think that this idea of separating them is actually important, um, that we can think about um, monuments also oftentimes tell national stories, right? And that's really important. They tell really big stories. Um, where memorials may, in fact, let's say the 9-11 is a memorial because it is honoring all of the deceased people from the Twin Towers. Um, and so this, Robert, the Shaw Memorial is a memorial. It is, in, it, in effect, St. Gaudens was honoring, right? The deceased, at the request of the Shaw family, the deceased uh, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw and the 50, members of the 54th um, as well. So yet, yet, in this really interesting way here on Commons, it has taken, because of its monumental scale, right? It also kind of occupies the space as monument as well. Right, and, 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 and its monumentality is what I guess I would argue, and it. its bigness, yeah. Great, All right, do you feel there is still value in maintaining monuments or memorials, even if they represent bad history? It's still history that people should remember. I think for me it's a question of like, what do we celebrate? And I think we celebrate things in public spaces. Uh, we can we can remember the bad history of museums and like we should put them there and I'm down for the museums, right? Like put <laughs> it all in a museum, um, <laughs> put the people that want them there. I think the second thing is that some of these things are made up, right? Like they're like, it's like, you're like, what is this, my, what is this statue about? Like that is, it's not telling something that's rooted in fact. Like it literally is like, it's a mythology around white supremacy and that is not, like that is true insofar as America was born in a racist everything, but so I don't know. I'm like a. I'm a mute. Put it in a museum. I think the public space is about what we celebrate. You must have run across this in Atlanta. Yeah, in we do um, every day. Um, <laughs> the, you know, for me, you know, what I hear is, you're gonna erase history. Well, actually, maybe if we take it out, but it's not the history you're thinking of. We might be erasing the Jim Crow history, because that's what the statue is about. That's what it is, okay? Now, then you can, if, it, if that, then if you recast it that way, and that's what you, how you interpret it, and if you can, and you can't always, and if it's in front of a courthouse and somebody has to walk in there to get a, a marriage license or is gonna be sentenced for something, has to walk back and fair, that could be a different situation. But that is a way of 
saying, yeah, no, that's actually, it's history. It's just not the history it was erected for. And do you want, and I've talked to people of all, you know, you know, races about this. And, and some of them, some African Americans say, no, I don't want, I want that to stay there because I want people to remember what happened, what was done to us. And this is the only thing left in the landscape that is about Jim Crow. The signs are gone, the water fountains are gone, everything is gone, incarceration stays, right? Mm -hmm. but, the, but this stuff is there. And so you can make that argument, maybe it's a good argument, it's a bad argument, but it's a, an argument to have a discussion and maybe shift the conversation. But some of it's like literally not. I went to the White House of the Confederacy, which is next to the State House in Montgomery, mm -hmm. and she tried to convince me that um, who who led the Confederacy? What were they? Not? Jefferson I, Davis. That, that Jefferson Davis adopted a little black kid. I was like, that was not adoption. Those are like, different papers. I'm like, Man, I can be with you for some of this stuff, but they did not adopt this little black boy. And there's like a whole children's book about how much they let a little black boy. And I'm like, that might be, that was not adoption, right? So like, <laughs> when I'm like, we could just delete that whole building, that is not about erasing history. That literally, like, that didn't happen. They did not adopt a black child. That didn't happen, right? <laughs> and like, I, I, there's a part of the mythology that, that supremacists actually want to hold on to, to like, to make this argument about like some moral purity. Mm -hmm. And like, I think that we actually have a responsibility to say that that's not, like she literally gave us a bag of cotton when we came in and then tried to tell us about this adoption story. It's like, mayo. that's not like, that's not real. Well, and I think that I actually fall on the side of actually removal. I do think, uh, for example, the Sturgis, why should a man who tortured black women have a monument? Why? Um, I understand why it happened at that moment. Uh, because that's what I study, but why should that persist in the 21st century? It makes no sense. Um, I think Confederate monuments, I think I might be a little bit in disagreement with you. I'm not sure we can recontextualize them within the museum context because then we're making them into aesthetic objects and I have a huge problem with that. I also think that there are um, the savviness of these white women's groups uh, to get their husbands who were lawyers and mayors and governors to put these objects on public space that they need to be moved, uh, to have a, th th this notion that, and they were savvy, like these women were super smart. No, 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 no that's why we have the Texas problem with textbooks. Yeah. It's the United Daughters Confederacy. Yep, that's right. They were the best propagandists ever. And so here we have, right, this, um, so I'm actually, I uh, think that the Confederate monument in Alexandria needs to come down or be moved. Okay, it's sitting in the middle of a city street. It was, and it is, has been a source a point for the African-American community for a hundred years. If you don't want it to go in the museum, where do you want it to go? You want it to, you didn't, I thought you were going to say destroy, and I'm like, okay. No, I'm not I, talking I about destroy. destruction. Well, I have this whole fantasy that we're going to like ship them to Texas and we can all go to a 10 acre park and if you want to, you can go see them down in Texas. I mean, I don't know. There are places where they have taken, and in, in, in oh. Eastern Europe, where they have taken all of these old monuments and stuck them in a park. There, uh, there's there's one on my bucket list called Stalin's World in Lithuania. Yep. Yeah. You can go crawl on Stalin, it's awesome. So I see that as, <laughs> but I do see that as one way of, of addressing this issue. I think the Confederate monuments, if they're in cemeteries, for me that's a, actually a different context uh, in a cemetery, in a private cemetery setting. But these monuments that are in public spaces, particularly where heinous, heinous actions have happened, they don't deserve to be memorialized uh, in my mind. Yeah. See, it's complicated. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and what we try to do at the History Center is say, it's the community who decides. Mm -hmm. and, but you have to have tools, you have to really understand what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and we say status quo is not an option. You either move it yeah. or you contextualize it, but you don't, do, you don't leave it uncontested. So can I, can I ask a real quick question? What is that contextualization? Because I, you know, I'm a museum person, I'm a, a historian, I get this. but. How do we not know what those monuments are about? We know what the context is. It's white supremacy. So there's a label saying this is a white supremacist monument. Actually, in some ways, make it a more acceptable monument if we leave it in place with the contextual text. Well, we don't know because we haven't done it. OK. That's and, what I was wondering. And, and right now, we've drafted some. I've, I've had some yeah, that okay. I'm, I'm taking to the city yeah. next week okay. based on what we did at our committee. And they're, they're reader rails. Mm -hmm. They have pictures, they tell the whole story of the monument. And You're why. saying keep it up in public and put a plaque. And, put yeah, a, put not, a plaque. and not a plaque, I'm talking about 
text. Text. Oh. And, and turn it into an artifact, right? They don't put a plaque on it that says this is, you know, a, but t turn it into something like you would see in a museum except in a public space. But who, it turns into an artifact for whom? For anybody. That only works, I think, if it's like, it, this is racist, is like the first, you know, like, the beginning. See, like, see, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> like that would, see, you, you know, I mean, you got to try, I mean, the thought is, if you can't, and under our law mm -hmm. in, in Georgia, you cannot remove them. So yeah, this is the only thing. thing that you can do, and my, my statement is, just get off your rear end and do something. Do what you can do. Mm -hmm. And then see if that makes a difference. It may, people, you know, it may convince people they want to remove it. Right? Or, or do an yeah. intervention. Right, and say, you know, I now really understand it needs to go. But it's a step. Yeah, yeah. Part of the complication, of my wife and I were at Harper's Ferry um, mm -hmm. not too long ago, and there's a monument is erected by the Daughters of the American Revolution competing with monument to the Union effort. And um, at the time we were there, we were there for a park a narration that was done very well uh, by a park ranger. Um, and, and then uh, that's great if you're there for that narration. Mm -hmm. If you're not there for the narration, What's the message? And that's that's was the complicated thing that uh, my wife and I were weighing after we left. It, it, mm. We we thought we got a nice education about the whole controversy, and it's important to know that. Mm -hmm. And if you're just coming through and you see the daughters of the American, very soft sell about how wonderful the South was. United Daughters Confederacy. Da United Daughters Confederacy. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, um, then it's another another story. Mm. Okay, we're going to ask our great thinking panel here. We're going into the lightning round. <laughs> Would you advocate for sick, removal of the Balls Lincoln Monument in part due to the humiliating position of the kneeling figure, or should it remain to remind us of a moment in time? This is the one, of course, across from the Four Seasons that you guys are looking at out of your hotel room. Take it down. I'm, I'm, I am not, I have some very strong feelings about Thomas Ball, about his racism, about the way in which he handled the, I mean, obviously there's a great distance between me and him, he was making that in the 1870s, but um, I'd say take it down. Okay, DeRay, what do you think? Take it down. Sheffield? People in Atlanta don't tell people in Boston what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sheffield it has a future in politics. Yes, he does. <laughs> the White okay. House is awaiting him. <laughs> the next question. How will it happen that young people understand why this is a subject they should be interested in, that is, statues from the past? I think, uh, I think I was in Tulsa and um, the Tulsa race rides or the Tulsa, mm -hmm. like Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. the, the, I can't, you can't even call it a memorial. The thing they put up to like say that happened is so insufficient that it is wild. And you know, we talk to young people now about it and like talk to them about it. And then you show like, it's literally like a big sort of thing that says how much money was lost by all the black people sort of, like that's what it tries to do. But it's like they bombed Tulsa. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like it wasn't like some people like came in throwing rocks with fire. They like bombed that strip and like that is wild. So when I think about how to contextualize this for young people, what I've seen work with activists is like tell the story of what happened and then say like how do you think they remembered it and then show that and then and then people have that moment being like is that it like when I went I was like oh this must be the beginning and then I was like this is the whole memorial <laughs> that is wild like. And around the corner, you can see like the house that you know people ran into to plan. But like that's it's like they bombed that neighborhood. So that's how I think about motivating them: tell the truth and then like show what is and what isn't. All right. Any other quick response to that one? That's cool. All right. We have a comment from our audience, which we think is good to close with: Monuments matter because it reminds us of the sacrifices people do forget. Oh. Right, very good. Please help me thank our panelists, DeRay McKesson, Renee Hader, Sheffield Hale, and our moderator, Derek Jackson.